Thank you. Your laptop's down there. So, <clears throat> so actually, the, the the transition from Dan's thing to mine is uh, smart contracts and uh, consensus. Okay. And so, just to say a couple of things that connect the talks. Um, so, I want to just tell you a little bit about where this is coming from, uh, because I wasn't doing anything with financial networks or anything like that. Uh, it happens we're doing something and that's very interesting with financial networks. Um, um, the talk's going to be about what ways are time, is time important in financial networks? And in keeping with this theme of the larger program, uh, real-time decision-making, real-time action. And um, we were working on something called self-programming networks. And uh, that ended up taking us towards very accurate clock synchronization algorithm system. And that has since been tested in some of these financial networks and elsewhere. And so I'm going to say that there are some interesting outcomes when this and that met. And that's what I'm going to, my talk's about, OK? Um, there are several people at Stanford who are involved in the self-programming networks research. One of them is uh, my colleague, Ren Mendel Rosenblum, um, operating systems, virtual machines, Mr. VMware, co-founder of VMware. And a whole bunch of students and who are here. Some of them are here. Dan Jeng is also here as a senior research scientist. So why don't I say uh, something about the financial networks first. And I'm going to use the slides or some portion of the presentation that uh, Tom Fay from NASDAQ allowed me to present. <coughs> Uh, so we had a workshop in Stanford in November, and uh, speaker Tom Fay, I, I tried to get him to come to this event, but he's otherwise busy, couldn't even do a remote presentation. So I'm going to just use a few of his slides. There's a much larger presentation he made. I'm just going to use four slides. Um, so there, uh, FinTech, the tech part, there is a lot of need for tech to be embraced. Uh, as viewed not just by the exchange guys like NASDAQ, but also by those that trade on the exchanges, like the investment banks, the hedge funds, and also the payments and retail folks, like you know Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, uh, retail banks like Wells Fargo, et cetera. So the, 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 what some of these uh, what, uh, folks are seeing are there are several things that they're looking at. Uh, notice blockchain. Um, but the four that Tom Fay chose to speak about are hardware acceleration, blockchain, machine intelligence, cloud services. I'm actually going to tell you about, because the clocks are relevant here and here, and I'm going to show you how. So uh, when you go to an exchange, to like a, like a NASDAQ or a New York Stock Exchange, and you're electronically trading, there's this place called the matching engine. And there are these things called gateways. So all transactions, whether of the sell or buy type, enter through gateways. And there are a few tens of, you know, some, sometimes low hundreds of these gateways. And all the bids make their way to the central matching engine. And these networks are very carefully designed to be almost precisely the same time from each gateway to the matching engine. I'll figure on this later, coming the, later on, OK? Uh, any mismatch in the time it takes to go from gateway I to matching engine versus J to matching engine is equalized almost immediately by running some slightly longer wires, for example. Okay? And there's also non-determinism that can cause fluctuations in the time it takes. And so the, a big no-no is uh, a transaction comes at some gateway I and another transaction comes afterwards at a gate, gateway J as viewed by some other third-party third observer. But the second guy gets processed first. Okay. This is simply the thing that's not allowed. And all exchanges fight really hard to ensure this doesn't happen. So hardware acceleration is taking the software components of the trip from the gateway entry point to the matching engine and hardwareizing them. Hardware lends determinism on the one hand, Certainly, Accelerate has faster processing capacity. 
But the most important thing it does is actually hardware pipelines are fairly deterministic. It, almost, it takes exactly the same number of clock ticks to do something. And there's the a certain slight congestion dependence, but modulo that, so when the volume of trading is high, then there's a certain non-determinism that creeps in because of congestion. But otherwise, there's no uh, congestion itself. So this was in white, and I just highlighted this. Uh, this is NASDAQ, and they were also citing the experience of uh, those who are not trading but actually running their end of day risk process. So this is all these high frequency trading algorithms or other algorithms whose parameters are tuned based on market data. Okay. So you, you see what happened today, you go tune your parameters, come back tomorrow, and then you know do it again, repeat. And that used to take a long time. Now it takes, um, uh, you know, it took eight hours, it's taking only 238 seconds or so, okay? So this is one way in which time is critical and that they're trying to remove the non-deterministic components. Okay. So I'm going to jump through several of his slides to uh, cloud. So this is all fine when you have designed your exchange uh, and it sits in some data center that you completely manage and you equalize this sort of time from gateway to matching engine. But that's not giving you the sort of scale that you want, not like Coinbase in the cloud. You know, there's this whole retail uh, exchange, retail traders on exchange that's become very interesting. So what if we move this from this d data center that I've uh, handcrafted to something in the cloud and there's no such guarantees available on you know, time from gateway to matching engine, okay? Um, so, since this is a part of a longer thing, um, I will click through to this few, few key points. I'm going to get to these in the second half of my talk. Fair access, this is the point about there's regulatory, regulatory requirements that the time taken, fair access is exactly what I said to earlier before, to you before. Transactions shall be processed in the order in which they arrived, no matter what gateway they arrived at. That's critical. And Cloud environments don't have high precision synchronized clocks because if they were there, then that's one way in which you could restore, uh, reorder transactions before you uh, execute the matching engine. So that's where this is very helpful, okay? So what are we talking about in terms of time? And so these are from so, so NASDAQ's perspective, but there's also other reasons in, for other players why time is critical. I will get to that later. I just wanted to motivate um, that there is a world in which both real time uh, decision making uh, and action are very important, and that is the financial industry. So uh, what is self-programming network? Just a few slides, so I'm not just sort of leaving you with no idea what, what we're doing and why accurate clocks ended up being important for us. Um, so self-programming networks is a quest to make networks be just autonomous and interactive. So we'd like networks to go to a cloud environment like Amazon or Google or Microsoft or your own private data center. And we'd like to get this network to sense and monitor itself and allocate its resources. That's what we mean by program and controllers. There's lots and lots of little decisions made. Bandwidth allocations, CPU allocations, memory allocations, all these allocations. We just want to automate them, okay? And uh, there's a sort of a dashboard that is designed to have queries and stuff be answered. And this is both something we've taken on board as something we will do. And you can, there's, an, there's a, a sort of natural language to SQL sort of translator, which is, there's a chatbot that allows us to do this. And so that, that's a whole bunch of work done, done by a bunch of students here. So again, now, so getting a little bit more uh, crisp, uh, at least you know, in terms of definition. Let's call this a plain old data center. There are a whole bunch of servers and they're interconnected through a fabric of switches and links. This is what every data center out there looks like. It's processing some workload, and it supports some apps, okay? And a self-programming network is just a shim where you go to this plain old data center and you sense something, I will tell you what, and then you process it, and then you uh, exert real-time control, where the control can come from bottlenecks in the network and or just operator policies. Things like the app can't have more than this amount of bandwidth, et cetera. That's, that's an operator policy. And there's something that you can use to peer into this data center. Now, the nice thing about this is if we could do it, 
we will get some new functionality that wasn't available in this plain old data center. For example, very accurate timestamping as a service, fine grained network telemetry, et cetera, and then that allows you to run some new apps that you could not run in this plain old data center. Okay? So I will tell you what they are and, uh, you know, as, as we go. So just to be, because it's, I was trying to link it to the previous session. Okay? So this is like a plain old Volkswagen Touareg. You add some sense and control to it, and it becomes a self-driving car. This is Sebastian's one, okay? So this transformation costed about 30% of the cost of this car, so it's, it takes $20,000 additional to go from there to here. So it'd be nice if the data centers could be self-programming at three to 5% of the cost. That's, a, that's an aspirational goal, let's say. So now, what is this precisely? All our sensing and control, we're gonna take uh, make it of the network interface cards. So the switches, are, we're, we're not relying on the switches. Okay, so this is one key point. So our LiDAR and our steering and gas, everything is all on the NICs, network interface cards. So historically, if you go to a data center, there are only two boxes that matter, servers and switches. And the NICs are like doormats. Packages wipe their feet when they go into the server or wipe their feet when they go out, that's about it, okay? So now people are building, uh, Smart NICs, and this is a very interesting proposition. So this is what uh, our work is, and this is the subject of my talk next week. So I'm gonna skip through to the, what's the outcome here? So when we say we're sensing everything from the NIC, we're gonna do it like this. Uh, in this data center, for every packet uh, that enters the data center, we're gonna take the transmit timestamp at the origin NIC, and the receive timestamp at the destination NIC, and just knowing this total time spent by the packet, we'd algorithmically like to decompose it into the time spent in each box. This is known as the tomography problem already in the literature. It was uh, attempted heavy in the internet world, but it wasn't very successful. There were a lot of good results, but it wasn't like jumping out into the real world. But in the data center, the setting is about right. Mostly it's because around, you know, the wire time is significantly small compared to the box time. That's what makes it work out, okay? Um, so, there's various reasons why it's interesting, but I'm gonna just tell you that many people are building smart NICs. Almost all the big hyperscale guys are doing it, lots of uh, Intel, uh, Mellanox, Broadcom, whole bunch of guys who are building NICs are building smart NICs. There's also a bunch of startups, so this is sort of uh, an appropriate meeting. But the moment you see this picture, I'm taking a timestamp here and a timestamp there. If the clocks aren't synchronized, this is useless. Okay, so, Two summers ago, uh, Elon Geng, who's here, had access to the Google 40G data center, and we had already done this, the reconstruction algorithm at Stanford in sort of a simulator, widely used network simulator. Then we went to, he went to Google, and the clocks are completely out of sync. Okay, like off by a few tens of microseconds, uh, you know, or bigger, or maybe a couple of hundred sometimes, and that just doesn't work for anything we want. Okay, so we ended up having to synchronize the clocks. There's a system that this led us to doing that. Um, I'm gonna skip through the next few slides just for in the interest of time. Uh, so uh, I will summarize the algorithms. The output is, the summary point is that it, it can synchronize to a few uh, large number of servers to a few nanoseconds, okay? And so this is better than anything you can do even with special uh, hand-built hardware, okay? So the system itself is like, you know, just to conclude this, right, you start with the plain old data center, you issue a set of probes and you take data packet, just take the timestamp, throw this in some database. This is sort of BigQuery for us in the cloud. And then you push it through this pipeline of first synchronizing the clocks, then the reconstruction algorithm, and you've got your sensing part at least done. Now the quest is to make it real time and then at scale, and then apply control, okay? All right, so one slide on what is this clock synchronization solution, I'm not, I don't have time to tell you more about it because I want to tell you about what it means for finance. So we call it Huygens for a particular reason and uh, it synchronizes clocks to tens of nanoseconds or even single digit nanoseconds depending on the network. It's been tested at various data centers. Um, in some of these guys are financial data centers like NASDAQ has tested it. Uh, so there it's all typically single digit nanoseconds because the load isn't so high as compared to these other big data centers, um, and otherwise in a few tens of nanoseconds, and 
Um, if you know what this means, it might mean something to you. Network time protocol, very widely used uh, for since at least 70s. Um, it's purely software. It's off by a few hundred microseconds to a few milliseconds. Uh, this is uh, similar in complexity for deployment, but just uh, faster. And so since the financial industry needs very accurate clock synchronization, they use precision time protocol and uh, pulse per second this is based on GPS and uh, they need specialized hardware okay so that's it so that's it I'm not going to say any more about clock sync but that it, it is necessary for us to do something else and it happens to have interesting use cases so how does it work in a few slides to conclude just to tie it up okay what does the financial industry care about clocks for well first of all there are business requirements okay and they are this fairness, the correct sequencing of orders according to arrival times before execution of the matching engine. Every exchange measures this very carefully. Very carefully they measure if this is happening or not. And, but you know, there's not easy ways of remedying this currently. Uh, smart contracts, this is an interesting topic in and of itself by the way. Uh, but one version of it that relies on clocks is you want to simultaneously release this market data uh, and other information. So in the NASDAQ slides, the one that had FPGA, it, it sort of talked about how they're speeding up things, but as well, you know, releasing things simultaneously. So nobody gets any advantage there, if, if possible. Um, but another more enhanced, interesting version of smart contract could be, I make you an offer to sell some number of shares or foreign exchange uh, trade with you that is only valid between microsecond X and X plus Y. Otherwise, the price will change, okay? And really, the only thing that can react to that speed is more or less hardware, but you need a clock to just be, mine and yours should be synchronized, or yours and all the other people who offered this to should be synchronized, okay? That's an example of what's coming. Um, transaction tracking is very, you know, whether in exchange or in the sort of payments industry, this is sort of a big deal. Um, Everybody wants to really understand this reconstruction part. So there's something called uh, market playback. This is the one I said. So you go do, everybody does this sort of risk, uh, this is all the simulations that they do. So almost all our sort of grad students are getting hired from the MLAI classes in the financial industry are all sitting and sort of figuring out they're, they're running this uh, market playback, okay? So they, the, this requires you to have uh, the ability to play back uh, the different feeds that came to you in pretty much the exact time sequence that arrived at you, okay? That's what that is. Um, so there's a lot of dispute settling, and then there's compliance requirements that are really, something goes bad, they have to have traceability, okay? So the European Union notably has put this thing of a, a transactions separated in fact by one microsecond in actual time shall be so time stamped. This is a requirement that's gone into effect January this year. And this is driving a lot of the industry to move to these accurate clocks. Okay. So I promised how this, uh, this picture on matching engines. So this is from the Euro Next, Ex Euro Next Exchange. Um, so here are all the sessions. This could be the broker traders. They're putting out this bids, little a, capital A, B, D, C from these guys and so on. And there's some number of gateways, one through N. Here are where the timestamps are taken. That would be great if the timestamps, the order in which they arrive here is exactly the order in which they get executed here, but there's a sequencing point that can in principle restore the order, okay? And so this is really what some of the work we're doing is already is very interesting for. But on the output side, this is the market data coming out, the order book, electronic order book information, one, two, et cetera, feeds. And these are all going back to these guys and others who are you're going to use that to come back with another bid, okay? So that's what it is. Now, if we could timestamp the transactions here very accurately and then resequence them here before execution, that's great. This is what we're working on. Uh, conversely, if we could also ensure that nobody receives um, order books ahead of anybody else, if possible, then that'll be another uh, thing about fair, fairness. And so, the, I want to conclude with one last slide on they can enable me. I've told you something very specific, very particular, so it looks like is all the exchanges of the world, including some new exchanges that are coming up in the cloud. So imagine doing all this in the cloud. This, you know, this, this picture is done 
for data centers that are people are building very carefully. But moving this to cloud can be enabled with these clocks. Um, distributed databases. So if you've heard of Spanner, uh, this global database from Google, which guarantees external consistency, it runs on a very precise uh, set of clocks down to seven millisecond synchronized around the world called TrueTime. Um, if you can crank that down to something much slower, then your read retry probability will go down and the throughput can increase in various positive, nice things can happen. So this is one place. Ledgers, uh, everybody has to say things in exactly the same order. And uh, ignoring the congestion is required to incentivize miners. Think of, think of distributed ledgers that where trust is not the issue, but it's just used for maintaining, like in the foreign exchange market, for example, and we spoke about this. Uh, there you're interested in high throughput and transactions, but you want an ordering service that gives uh, all, the, all the pairwise transactions that are taking place between nodes are ordered so that it goes in the uh, overall single ledger, a copy of which is available everywhere in the right sequence. So at any point I know how much balance you hold versus you hold. At markets where it's not a listed stock, don't have a central matching engine, so transactions are happening pairwise, like foreign exchange. And pub subsystems, if you know what that is, Kafka, for example. So almost all the financial industry guys use it, but also others. And it's used for many things, of consistency, ordering services, leader election, everything uses some consensus algorithm. And if you have accurate clocks, that can speed this up. And so I've mentioned smart contracts and peer-to-peer -peer trading. So I'll stop there, and thank you. Do financial markets worry about multi part multilateral transactions? Everybody's doing bilateral. Uh, they do. They do. Uh, Does that complicate your picture? Well, it complicates it in a sort of a challenging sense, like you know what Dan was saying. Then it just we should be working on it even more. Okay. But even something uh, that is known, so all all order books are single asset. So if, if, in other words, what that means is if I want to sell Google shares or Amazon shares and get some other shares, uh, then I have to go through dollars. So I can't do shares directly to shares, okay? But the existence of multi-asset order books is known. There's, since 72, uh, Merton's, uh, Jean-Francois Merton's has described how they can be built and you, know, you can do it. That's an example of something that can be enabled uh, if you have trading systems that not so, sort of the star shape, go to the single matching engine. Okay, and so, so it's not, it's not multi-party, but it's multi-asset. Yeah. Right, and there are multi-party thing where, you know, little like, I will give you this provider, you will give that, yeah. like that, that, that exists. But I'm not very familiar, maybe CMAC knows more about such things, but. I mean, existing exchanges for a single asset are already multi-party. If you go in and put in an order to buy a thousand shares of Google, you might be transacting with 10 different people because of split lots. Right. right. Are there ways to get provable guarantees on uh, the timestamps? I'm thinking about like applying this in, for example, blockchain context and you're worried about double spend attacks and who sent them first. So if you look at like, you know, uh, there's something that, uh, it was a very interesting question. So I can for sure say um, that the time is after 4 p.m. But, but before 5 p.m., right? So the larger the granularity of time is, the more easy it is to be certain. Then it's all probabilistic down in the nanos and picos, even in the micros, you already. So uh, from true time onwards, it's a probabilistic guarantee. Uh, it, just almost impossible to be accurate, uh, 100%, okay? So uh, yes, uh, that is simply, you test it, and you can prove some things too, mathematically. ordering of transactions, why is there such a premium placed on you must, ma you must process transactions? So it changes the value of the asset. So if, if you want to buy some number of shares, and I'm simply going to come ahead after you and dump it, dump those shares, then the price, uh, you know, uh, it's, it could either be artificially low or artificially high, depending on which side you're on. There's no continuity when you get down to that scale. I would think that in a microsecond, how much the price goes. No, the thing is, I was telling CMAX, so uh, this is almost is getting into panel discussion level, but I will just answer this in an elaborated way. 
I was shocked in, in the following thing. I had never heard, of, I've heard, I know layer two switching, that's Ethernet switches, layer three is IP switching. I never heard of layer one switching, that simply is an optical, you know, great uh, diffraction greater, uh, but grating. Then there's a, I heard of a switch from a company called Meta Mako, and that's what they're doing. They're doing layer one switching because they just can't afford to wait, okay? So who's responding and flipping back this thing at such great speeds? FPGAs. So the parameters are all set in FPGAs. They're sort of lazier algorithms that may be looking at data and doing their ML, whatever they're doing, and then they come back and set parameters in FPGAs. That's who's flipping this. And it's coming back, the, the, the velocity is very high. I'll make a comment also. I mean, uh, we can so prices the, aren't, uh, aren't, aren't continuous. continuous. Yeah. There's, there's in, instances of time where, uh, um, you know, let's say uh, you're looking at equities and the S&P 500 goes up one tick, right? Well, every U.S. equity is going to go up a little bit, right? So if you notice that, you're sort of the post in line, like basically, before price change, uh, the price is going to 